Hi, I'm Debbie Lynn Molino, President and CEO of Bridge Alliance. Bridge Alliance is a network of 100 democracy strengthening organizations, and I'm joined today by Egberto Willis to talk about his new book, It's Worth It. So, Egberto, welcome. Nice Thank to be chatting with you today. Thank you very much for having me here, Debbie Lynn. You know, um, I, your work speaks for itself. So, I mean, I'm, I'm extremely happy to, uh, to talk to you about this book. Well, and I wanted to just like cut right to the chase and say, how did you come up with this title? It's worth it. Well, you know, most uh, once I went, I, I do a lot of writing on the progressive side and I wrote a note on Daily Coast once and I said, we need to start, uh, we need to stop talking directly to the choir, if we really want to have a ruling democracy, a democracy movement where we can actually get things accomplished, it can't be 50 plus one. It has to be a large base. And the pushback that I got was those people cannot be changed. And not only can those people not be changed, it's not worth putting the effort in them. Let's just mobilize our base. My answer to that was mobilizing the base does not do anything because at the next election cycle, that's what they are going to do. They are going to be mobilizing their base as well. What we need is an American base. Well, that's lovely framing and it aligns, as you know, uh, with a lot of the thinking that that I've had in this work of trying to get people to collaborate together and actually solve the issues of the day instead of trying to dominate the other side which is, I think is what you're pointing to. So, Igberto, one of the, the th- other things that I love about your book is you talk about, like, you're not trying to persuade people to change their mind, that you're planting seeds. Can you, can you share a little bit more about how you do that and, and what it benefits you have come back to you from it? Yeah, I actually, you know, I think that is one of the most important things there, Devlin, and especially the way you just said it, because here's the thing. If you go into a discussion wanting to tell that person something and that they're going to change their mind and say, oh, I've seen the light. Thank you so much for telling. If, if that's the kind of change you get out of somebody, the same way you had the power to do that, somebody else has to, the power to undo that. Um, so I, I believe I prefer to plant a seed. In other words, I don't want somebody to come back and say, I agree with you. I just want to leave that thought in their mind so that when something apropos comes along, they can, they can have that as something to fall back on. It starts to grow in their minds. You know, I am not biblical or, or anything, but I always remember about the seed falling on rock versus sand versus good earth, right? And that was a good parable, right? And the reason why is that if you lay a foundation, people change more permanent. So I don't want somebody to change and become a Democrat from a Republican or vice versa or become a liberal from a conservative. I want them to, on an issue-based thing, take what we're talking about and apply it to what they're doing. And I think ultimately what happens then is, you know, um, in engineering, we have this stuff, Matthew, we have this stuff called the derivative, right? or the integration of a different, what happens thereafter is people start to converge on in one place. And it, if it doesn't happen overnight, it's best because it's more long lasting. Actually, I think it's permanent if it doesn't. I was going to say it's a lot more stable. I have found if it, that's the word. Yes. If it takes place over time versus that instant conversion. Right. Which, as you mentioned, could be as, as easily undone, not always, but sometimes, but more Absolutely. often. Absolutely. And uh, it, it, you know, this work, I, it, I'm reminded of the story that um, Megan Phillips Roper talks about in, her, in a TED talk about coming out of the Westboro Baptist Church cult and how it was people who started as strangers, who engaged with her over time, planted seeds with her, came, came to her understanding you know, and approached her from within her belief structure and gave her things to think about that started causing the dissonance that eventually led to her leaving after five years, leaving the Westboro Baptist Church. For five years. Five years. It took five years of engagement. And so I, for Americans, I, I think part of the, what I really love about your book is that you're giving people some of the tools that are necessary and some of the anecdotes and stories that, that you have experienced. Not that people who disagree with us are in a cult. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that 
the long term, we, we both need to be the fertile soil that seeds can be planted in, as well as planting seeds in other people's fertile soil. And our job individually is to make sure that our minds are fertile soil and not rocks or sand. And you spend a lot of time in, in your book talking about framing and reaching people where they're at. Can you t- tell me like a couple of your favorite stories from your, uh, uh, of how you've done this? Yeah, well, one of, one of the things about it is, um, especially on the progressive side, somewhat on the, the right, uh, we know what we, we think we know what we want. And what that really means is that we are right. And what we're trying to do is to convince you that you need to change the way you are. And the truth of the matter is, I still feel that way. I still feel that I'm right. And I still feel that I need to uh, change other people. But when I get to, when I try to do, use my empathetic side, I start to ask the question, what if they have the same feelings that I do? And when you put yourself in those shoes, you start to have to ask yourself that other question. And the truth of the matter is, in speaking to conservatives, I am not a conservative, but in speaking to conservatives, they have changed my mind on many things. And they've, they've caused me to, to redouble my efforts and seeing, well, you had to come to that conclusion from some reality, and all those realities aren't necessarily uh, what many on the progressive side think, which is uh, that is an alter, alternate state of reality. Some of it comes from living. And, you know, in, in my own personal life, I've actually seen that. I used to be a complete, uh, you know, this completely 100% egalitarian. I wanted to give everybody everything until I realized, well, if you don't work at certain things, that, that can actually be a negative thing. Yeah, that, that's great. And so, so you mentioned reality and people like having different realities. Do you think there is an objective reality or is, it, or is all reality subjective? Okay. I always come out and people say, why do you always say that? I'm an engineer by training. Before I got it, I've always been politically active, but I'm an engineer by training, which means I love numbers. For me, numbers speak everything. Now, one plus one in our universe will always equal two. So that is not debatable. Uh, but things like, um, let's say abortion, right? When does life begin? The truth of the matter is I don't know. Uh, so when, if I become a, a uh, I don't like to call it pro-life, or if I become a, a somebody who wants to control as a woman yourself and tell you as a woman that you can't do certain things because I think for me to be able to do that, I have to be, I have to be claiming that I know more than I could possibly know. So that is the reason that I take the stance. So when it comes to reality, when it comes to absolutes, one plus one will always equal to two. F will always equal a maid. Force through distance, all those things are true. But there are certain things in our socialization, there are certain things in our lives that it is impossible for us to know there's a right or wrong answer. So what I do is I separate issues. Where things are uh, one plus one is equal to, I cannot possibly compromise. And at that point, I just have to find a way to say, if you don't see it that way, we are just going to have to disagree and you are wrong. But in these other instances, I'm going to have to say, well, you know, I believe this and this is how I'm going to live my life. Please allow me to live my life that way as I will allow you to live your life the way you want to live yours. So... So, Egberto, talk to me a little bit about how you listen to others, because there's a lot of research out there that's showing that the denigration and the dehumanization is happening right now because nobody's listening, and therefore there's this lack of respect. So talk to me a little bit about how you listen. That is actually so true, Devilyn. Um, let me tell you what I had to learn, okay? What I learned, I, I, I am sort of one of those strange people that would go in complete darkness and think. I'll turn all the lights out and just start thinking, right? And one of the things I realized is that I did too much talking and not enough listening. So I told, I, I, and, and by the way, you have to teach yourself to listen. I didn't realize that. And the way I taught myself to listen was to simply go naked. In other words, I wasn't going to attempt to look for a comeback at all. I am just going to listen to you, you know, and listen to what the person had to say. 
And then after I listened to what the person had to say, stop and then think about what they said and find an answer instead of not listening to their entire statement and trying to, for that next comeback, that next comeback to win. And what it meant is there are times that I wasn't winning, you know, and that, that and, and, and trying to be able to get there is hard as hell because I like to win, you know, I want to win, you know, and, but again, like I said, just listening made it that much better because suddenly you, you, you got a better feeling for that person. Hey, it didn't just come out of being crazy. It didn't just come out from being from an alternate state of reality. It actually had a genesis somewhere. Well, and I'm wondering as well if um, the seed planting that goes both ways, uh, it, it, as we're out there in the world planting seeds in each other's minds, if the seed planting isn't more fertile for having been thoroughly listened to. I think so. You know, because I know that I am much more willing to listen to somebody who's listened to me. Mm-hmm than I am if I'm with somebody who's constantly distracted on their phone or whatever, I'm not going to, you know, my mind is not very open to what they have to say when they finally put their phone down and talk to me. And, uh, you know, and I think that, that, that just says it right there. That just says it right there. Mm -hmm. We have to, the other person have to know that you are respectful of them enough to care enough about what they're saying. Mm -hmm. Uh, throughout the book, you share a lot of anecdotes of different people that you've talked to, often from your regular seat, if you will, at Starbucks. Yes. <laughs> and, and I wonder if you have, um, if any of those stories, if any of those folks have circled back around to acknowledge, like, how you've helped them think differently, and if you could share a, a tidbit about that. Several, actually, but the one that always comes to mind is, uh, you know, I mean, first of all, people always think about the Republican white guy as being this guy that is immutable. He'll never change and he's just strict in his ways. And whenever he sees me at Starbucks, he comes in and he have a talk and there are times he'll just slap me on the back and say, I have one for you. And he'll go ahead and tell me right away, I want to uh, tell you why you are wrong. You know, so once we had a conversation on on uh, immigration and as you know, I'm an immigrant from Panama, Central America. And so it's one of my pet peeves. And I told him, hey, guy, um, the, the, these are some reasons why I think uh, it is immigration is a necessity, et cetera. But, you know, you should go ahead and do your own research. You should go ahead and do this on your own and so forth. And one day I'm sitting down blogging and he just walked in there and he slapped me on the back again and he say, I have something to tell you and I think you're going to like it. And I'm like, oh, really? And then he's like, I am 100% in for immigration and all this sort of stuff. We must have them because the, the country doesn't create enough jobs and in order for social security. And he gives me the whole thing, you know. And as you know, I'm a blogger as well. And I said, Wow. And first of all, when I got over my shock, because this is the last person that I would ever have thought would have said something like that. And he was comfortable enough to talk about it with me. And I said, you know what? Let me tell you something, brother. I need you to do me a favor. Uh, could you write a blog for it? And I just expect him to say, no, I mean, I'm not going to put myself out there. And the guy said, yes, I will write a blog on immigration, of course, it will have the Republican spin on it, to which I said, thank you, to which I'll also tell you, I'll publish it. And he did. It was a wonderful piece. I even played it at the most progressive site in the country, dailycoast.com, and they liked it. I, I would have done a lot of things differently in it because I am not a, you know, I, I, there are certain things I don't believe in, but it's something that we could agree on. That is something that the outcome was going to be good for both sides. And, and I just, I love that story. And you mentioned earlier that conservatives have changed your mind on several things. Is he one of those people that has helped you change your mind on some things? Of course, of course. I mean, I, the, the thing about it, Devilin, is 
I am not going to, when I have a discussion, I, I, I'm going to sit down and think about it. And th these are, by the way, I want to say something important. Uh, I've known you for a long time and we've been in uh, the coffee party. We've been in, and I've done some work for uh, other organizations that I know that uh, you've been associated with. And just being in those organizations that weren't liberal, they were actually trying to either hit the middle or tinted to the right. And the truth of the matter is uh, I got a whole lot out of it because earlier on in life, I would not even have given it a second thought. A lot of things I would just say, it's simply wrong. And now as I got older and as I associated with more people that, you know, they love their families just like anybody else, you know, it gave, it, it gave pause to, to try to make that change. And that is one of the reasons I wrote the book. It's like, hey, guys, it's not, even, it's not even giving up who you are. You know, it's just a matter of expanding the people that you hang with. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting um, because one of the things that I have always kind of distinguished is there's like a where I fall, where I fall and where others fall on the political spectrum. And then there's our approach of, of how we get there, how we actually enact or, or activate on our issues. And what I've seen over the last nine years is that you've come kind of come back into like still extremely progressive in your politics, but very moderate in your approach. And the fact that you engage people with so much respect in, in listening to them and incorporating and acknowledging where they've changed your mind. Do you think there is hope for America through this moderate approach of listening and responding and engaging over long periods of time? Uh, Debbie Lynn, I think there is hope for America and I think that is the only way that we can do it. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not even a choice. The only way we're going to make progress is if I listen to you. And if I know that I've said something that's important, most people are good. And that's what I found. Most people are good. And I have all kinds of friends of every persuasion of every kind of culture of every kind of character. And uh, my thing is, if I, if I teach, first of all, I preach that we have a system controlled by a very few, and that that very few need to have the masses fighting among each other in, other, in order to stay on top. If you don't have that, then others are going to say, wait a minute, why are you up there alone when this country does, you know, we all do everything together, right? So, I mean, it, it's, it's, so that is important for us to move forward. We have to be able to get along. And I have, after I speak, like I said, I live in a very conservative area. And in speaking to mostly conservatives because of where I live and in being among them as well, it is clear, it is clear that, uh, these people put their pants on like I do. They care about their kids like I do. They want to go to college like I do. There are forces that tell them they can only do it their way. Uh, and, and somehow also that making them scared of some people is uh, what's going to get things across. And when they, I want to, I want to, there's a story, a quick story that I want to talk about. This woman, she sees me in Starbucks all of the times. So, okay. Here I am in a Republican area is where I live. And there's this black guy inside of Starbucks. And one of the things that she first probably believes is, uh -huh, I'm here, I'm this Republican guy. So she's very, she, there's a level of comfort that she has. And we started to discuss healthcare. I'm not going to make it a long story, but eventually when she starts to agree with me, I feel a little bit of guilt because I, I know she's an ultra conservative woman and she's agreeing with all these things that I'm saying about healthcare. And I look at her and I feel a little bit guilty. Now. And I said, ma'am, I just want to let you know, I'm a left wing con uh, uh, progressive guy who believes in Medicare for all. And she looks at me and I also use the word liberal. And then she looks at me in horror. She turns red and she says, but you are so nice. And I said, ma'am, you need to hang with some more people like the, the liberal ladies who lunch. All of them are nice and you are nice. You know, I'm, so we were talking and it was like the caricature that the, the leaders of these different sides make of 
the other side is what has a whole, have this big problem that we're having. And once people start to talk one on one, they realize, man, we ain't all that different, you know. I love I love that story too. And and you and I both know that that actually engaging with people uh, gets through a lot of that barrier uh, and the caricatures that we that you know are given to us by the powers that be through the media and such. And I just want to thank you again for writing this book. And uh, is there any last things that you want to say for people to know about? Well, yeah, I want to, I want to ask everybody to engage. I mean, you have a group called the Bridge Alliance and you worked with other groups like uh, uh, conversations, living room conversations and all these groups. Look up all these different groups and try to be a part of them. And the reason why is because they work. And if we follow their lead, I think uh, we'll, we'll, be do, we'll be doing the patriotic thing. And that patriotic thing is, uh, you know, we're all Americans. If we can all get together, you don't have to change uh, your ideological stance. You just have to remember that your ideological stance is not abs- always absolute. I think that's just, that's lovely advice, Egberto. And thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much for having me, Debbie Lynn.